now. Great, so um, <clears throat> there's been emails flying around, but really this opportunity came up with the funding that was given to us from FPSC um, to help integrate maternity or perinatal care within to the PCN. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to invite a few communities, um, some of which I've seen present before, around their models that are working for them with um, inter interdisciplinary teams and maternity care. And we're hoping that we can learn a thing or two in this first session. And then towards the end of March, we're going to have a second session in which we'll be able to explore our current landscape a little bit closer. Um, think of the great ideas that you're presenting here tonight and how we can maybe take some of those pieces and put them into place in Powell River and come up with something that um, is sustainable. Um, for everyone here um, in our community, both on the provider side, as well as great for our patients. Um, so tonight on the line, we will have three clinics presenting. Um, the South Okanagan, uh, Okanagan Birthing Center, um, the South Community Birth Program, and then probably going last will be the Chickadee Maternity Collaborative in um, Dawson Creek. Um, but Megda is actually on another call right now, and so she's uh, opted to go last, so she'll be signing on a little bit later. Um, and then as far as the format goes, I just thought that we could each, each clinic could take about 20 minutes to do their presentation, um, and then there'll be uh, time for some questions and answers and a little bit more dialogue, if that sounds okay. And I guess I'm just looking to the presenters. Would you prefer to take questions um, at the end of your presentations or wait until the end of kind of the hour after everyone has had their turn to speak? I likely have to leave a bit early for another meeting. So okay. for the South Okanagan Maternity Center, I yep. wouldn't mind if we could do questions after, we after your presentation. Okay, well, why don't we do that and I'll do my best to keep everyone on time. So if I cut anyone off, it's not to be rude, it's just to keep things flowing. They do want to get everyone out of here by seven and then hopefully we can do any follow-up questions via email afterwards. If that sounds okay, um, I will hand the mic over to um, the South Community Birth Program. So Dr. Nair, if you wanted to introduce yourself or I don't know if it's you or Linda that wanted to start off, but I'll hand it over to you. Yes, I'm very informal. Dr. Nair is, is my mom, and I'm much more comfortable with Kieran. <laughs> um, it's lovely to meet you all. Is it possible? So I actually do have a PowerPoint that I was going to share. Is it possible to share my screen? You should okay. be able to. Okay, perfect. Uh, yes, I can. Fantastic. There we go. Okay. I'm going to see if it's possible for me to do this in presenter mode. Uh, bear with me for a sec. Um, I don't think I can just share my screen that way. So I'm, I'll just go backwards and I think I'll just have to share, um, sorry, the regular way and pardon me, I'll have to look down at some of my notes here. Um, I want to do prevent I guess play from start there we go can you all see my screen there all right um so it's lovely to meet with you all Linda and I um are at the South Community Birth Program and we are uh on the ancestral and unceded and traditional territories here of the Musqueam Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations uh in Vancouver so South Community Birth Program, it's always uh, amazing to me when I start talking about the program or when I start talking um, um, to patients about the program, because in, incredibly, uh, South Community has been around since 2004. Um, the project started uh, in 2005 by Lee Saxel uh, and the late Sue, Sue Harris, who were both uh, heads of the departments of their own respective departments, so the Department of Family Practice and the Department of Midwifery. Uh, at the time, uh, Linda was one of the original midwives who was hired at South Community Birth Program. 
And there was a couple of different um, initial uh, bits of funding money. So there was some um, transitional funding for the Start of South Community Birth Program with the Federal Primary Healthcare Transition Fund, as well as some PHSA and Vancouver Co uh, Coastal Health Authorities um, in British Columbia. But at the current moment, and, and that tra uh, transitional funding only lasted a few years, we are entirely fee for service. We pool all of our billings and we pay uh, call and clinic sessionally. We have an alternative payment plan with MSP. So we bill antepartum uh, and postpartum through the midwifery codes and the birth is billed to the attending uh, provider. So if it's a GP, it's billed under the GP codes. If it's a midwife, it's billed under the midwifery codes. We also have an alternative practice arrangement with the College of Midwives, which is, I think, all of the practices here. It's becoming a much more common thing to see across the province. We have a doula program, which is partially supported by Women's Hospital, and the rest of the doula program is uh, supported by our South Foundation, which is our charitable foundation at South Community Birth Program. It's predominantly money that we raise by asking people to, to, to donate to our foundation. We are situated in a lovely, spacious 4,000 square foot building in East Vancouver uh, that we share with our sister program, which is the South Hill Family Practice um, that has 14 GPs and a nurse practitioner, some of whom work on both sides. And the family practice currently has a panel of four, uh, 14,000 patients. I might need somebody to move my, oh no, down at the bottom, there we go. Um, so South Vancouver, it is a very ethnically diverse area. Uh, in and around the time that South Community Birth Program was established, it had an immigrant uh, population of 45%, uh, with 18% of uh, immigrant families having arrived within the last five years. And before the establishment of South, there were no midwives or OBs and very few family physicians who were actually uh, providing maternity care in South Vancouver. The core program feature, so I'm going to touch on all of these a little bit tonight and being very mindful of the time. Sorry if I talk quickly. Um, we are a multidisciplinary team providing highly collaborative care. We offer connecting pregnancy, which is the opportunity to do pregnancy care in a group setting. And we have a doula program, which incorporates doulas onto our team. Currently, um, we have 13 providers. We are much more midwifery heavy. So we have 10 providers who are midwives and we have three family physicians. Many of our providers uh, wear multiple hats, um, working in admin, which Linda is, is the model example of that, working um, at the department and then also provincially. Um, and we have two GPs uh, who work on the South Hill side. So our sister family practice or in other community-based practices. We have an obstetrician who's with us, Dr. Astrid Christofferson Deb, and she works on site with us one day a week and collaboratively with our nurse practitioner. They run their OB team, the high risk team. We have a pediatrician who works one day a week. We have the equivalent of three full time postpartum nurses who do almost all of our postpartum care and feeding specialists. Uh, we have one full time nurse practitioner who is also an LC who does an, a lot of antepartum care along with working with our obstetrician on the high risk and she also runs anxiety uh, programming a, a pregnancy group that she calls mother load. 23 doulas um, who speak 14 different languages who are all wrangled and trained by our doula coordinator, Jelena Grant, who's been with us since the beginning of time. Um, and we have four full time medical office assistants as well as a half HR manager program intake manager. Um, it's incredibly, I'm not going to read you this slide, you can read it, but it's incredibly rewarding for us to work at South um, in our multidisciplinary collaborative model. We're super committed to the idea of working together as a team collaboratively. Uh, we've developed shared vision, philosophy, and I think the big thing is we communicate a lot. And that's what it, you'll always hear about South. Oh, yeah, you guys communicate all the time. And I think especially with a big team and a collaborative team, we do have to do a lot of communicating. We've tried to create a culture of openness and curiosity, as well as fearless self-reflection. And that one is very hard. <laughs> Uh, we support each other personally and professionally as we've come to realize that the two are almost impossible to fully separate, especially doing maternity care. And we're committed to learning from each other in respectful ways. So GPs and midwives at South Community are completely interchangeable. It's not that you have both, you have one or the other. And if we do our jobs well, you actually can't tell the difference between us. 
We always have one person who's on call. It's either a GP or a midwife. And we always have a backup second on call because unfortunately babies don't seem to pace very well. And so sometimes we go days and days with nothing. And then we go days and days where all the babies decide to come. We're a really busy practice. We do 55, usually births a month at women's. Uh, and we do not provide home birth at South Community. Our nurses at South Community do most of our postpartum care from day two until six weeks postpartum. The care happens on site at South Community Birth Program, and they work really closely with our care providers and our nurse practitioners. But the bulk of the care for the postpartum person and the babe happens with the nurses. And I often say that they do most of the heavy lifting. Um, you know, that cheerleading at the postpartum and helping new families establish feeding plans and maintain their feeding plans. We're very lucky to have um, postpartum nursing care six days a week, so we can see people as little or as much um, as they need to be seen. We work really hard to keep our team collaborating well, and it takes a lot of work from the team as well as in leadership. And I think that's one of the things that's probably needs to be talked a lot about in terms of these collaborative larger teams is, is, is the leadership. Um, you know, moving from more siloed uh, care has some big challenges and we work really hard by meeting regularly, by doing retreats, by doing continuing medical education and a lot of discussions that happen on our electronic medical record. Um, there is always a, a lead for the week too. So whether it's myself or uh, Lee Saxell, there's always one of us who's available to answer questions. Um, yes. I'm gonna switch here and talk a little bit about connecting pregnancy is get a little emotional because we actually for the last two and a half, I guess, where are we at now? Is it three years, almost three years? We haven't actually been able to do group in person. Um, and we are in the works of um, getting back to thinking about being able to do person. I, I'm laughing because it was much easier when the province told us what we weren't allowed to do. And now they're like, hey, you figure it out how you go back to in-person. So this is our big, beautiful group space at South. Uh, and we've missed it a lot. We pivoted very quickly, although it felt very hard to pivot to doing most of our group on Zoom um, during the pandemic. Um, we do what is called Connecting Pregnancy. It is our Canadian adaptation of centering pregnancies. Um, we have been offering Connecting Pregnancy since the beginning of time at South. Um, we are the leaders in Canada doing Connecting Pregnancies with 300 to 315 families going through Connecting Pregnancy every single year at South. Um, the pillars of Connecting Pregnancy, they are your medical care, your education, and probably the most important thing and the hardest thing for us to get people to realize, it's the connecting piece. We, we get a little stuck on the education and the in, information dissemination, but it's the connecting piece that's been the most significant for us with our, with our families. The sessions fuse content and the opportunities for groups to connect. This was one of our COVID adaptations. We have a be beautiful park really close to South. So in the middle of COVID, when we could do our sessions in person, we did them outside. And we have one of our doulas here who does a session with us, Noriko-san. She it works within our Japanese community. And she talks about the things that we can do in our pregnancy, as well as things we can do in labor to help our labors be more progressive from the doula's perspective. So that's the session that we did there. Um, group at South, it runs over nine to 10 sessions starting around 19 to 20 weeks of pregnancy and it goes until about four to six weeks postpartum. So it's around 20 contact hours. We have a manual which we share freely. PSBC has all of our information with content and videos and discussions for each session, which we are continually adapting based on the feedback we get from patients and families. There are always about 11 pregnant people and their partners in each group, and it's co-facilitated by one provider and either a South nurse or a South doula. We strongly, strongly encourage partners to participate, and I think that's helped us to evolve the content so that it's very inclusive of partners. Um, and anecdotally, I've often wondered whether or not, you know, having people buy in and get very participatory in pregnancy actually helps partners stay participatory postpartum and maybe in the long-term distribution of um, of, of unpaid household work. Um, so that's just one thing I've often wondered about. Um, the, the key for us is we keep the groups constant. So other than cross covering each other for vacations, the group has a constant, uh, um, has constant um, uh, uh, facilitators. 
And like what I'm doing right now, we try to make group very, very facilitative as opposed to didactic, because we know that the attention span of adults is like eight to 10 minutes. And so we have to do a lot of work and really have had to learn how to facilitate. Um, pregnant people um, are involved in their self-care activities. So when they come in, they do their blood pressure. If they choose to weigh themselves, they can weigh themselves. And that's given to their care provider when we do um, their uh, self, their, their belly check. The hard part about doing group, both for providers and for patients, is moving away from having tons of contact time just between one patient and the care provider. And so a lot of, 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 of um, kind of making sure that people understand this is really doing a ton of, of, of educating around how this model works and how to move the questions to the group. Obviously, there's some things that can't move to the group, but in general, a lot of the questions can move to the group. And because everybody's due in the same half of the month, a lot of the questions are, um, most of the questions are very relevant to everybody else in the group. Um, I find in general, especially if I'm doing a group of 11 people and everybody needs to have a GBS swab, you know, I might not see 11 people and I definitely wouldn't see 11 people in a clinic afternoon all do at the same half of the week. But what I get to do is actually flush out a GBS swab discussion, probably in a lot more detail, but I don't have to repeat myself constantly. And, and so sort of it, that, that piece of it is, is, is lovely. I think the other thing that can be both an advantage and a disadvantage um, and it's care provider dependent is that we take ourselves out of the center of care. We sit in a circle together. We're there to facilitate discussions and kind of be the river guide for the discussions. But you know, um, when people are discharged back into the community at the end of it, they haven't lost everybody who's been involved in this journey for them. And so it can be lovely because they build this entirely community that's watched them transition into this huge, huge, huge new role as a parent. Um, one of the big advantages, I would say, um, to doing care or how I try to sell it to patients is that I think there's a lot of safety in numbers, definitely in pregnancy, but especially postpartum. There's so much that's so common and so normal in pregnancy and early postpartum, but it's it's new and it's scary. And just having a group of people that you can connect with who are all going through the same thing, I think provides people with so much comfort. This is actually my first group um, that we transitioned to Zoom. I'm smiling there, but it was deep, deep, deep in early pandemic days when we were all terrified and we had no idea what was coming. Um, but as you can see, like even though we transitioned halfway through pregnancy, we still had a ton of participation of partners through the whole journey, which was really, really beautiful. Um, sessions are organized around gestational age and appropriate information and discussions are facilitated. We bring in guest speakers, which is really fun so that it's not just us talking and we get to bring in experts who actually know a little bit more about very specific things that we, uh, we don't know as much about. So we bring in speakers to talk about pelvic floor health, exercise and pregnancy. We bring in our therapist to talk about anxiety and the transition to parenthood. We talk a lot about that transition. That's the, a huge feedback is like, it's the ha there's the having the baby and then there's the rest of your life and adapting to life with a baby. Um, and I think for me, as somebody who started doing this before I had a baby and as I have a seven-year-old now, it's been really, really lovely just to sort of be a bit more reflective myself in this journey of, of parenthood and be able to ref reflect some of that back in the work that I do. Um, we encourage people to connect super duper early. They get to choose what platform that they connect on. Um, and our hope is to create a lot more resiliency in the community that we're creating around birthing and having these babies and that the struggles are not alone and you have other people who are going through this journey with you. Um, we hear over and over and over again after the babies arrive, like how would you ever do this without group? How could you possibly have a baby without this community of people around you? Um, this was one of my favorite um, um, pictures of us in the pandemic, taking pictures of the babies, because we used to smush them all together on a couch and take the sh schlumpy baby picture. And then we couldn't do that anymore. We're like, okay, we'll socially distance your babies, but we'll still take a, a picture for you. <laughs> um, here, sorry, I'll move my, I'm probably blocking um, so you can see. Um, this is a session we did actually with one of our facilitators. We brought an incredible facilitator in, I think three times, is actually coming back in to, to work group in May. Um, and we brought him in to help us figure out how to facilitate because we all know how to deliver babies and we know to help people with breastfeeding for the most part, but how do you facilitate a group of 24 adults? And how do you, um, you know, 
bring in speakers, hold tough stuff at times, especially when people start to tell their birth stories. Um, and he, it's been really helpful for us. And I think we've all grown as humans starting to do this work, uh, facilitating groups. But these are the words that we all picked out as, as, as facilitators or as care providers about how we felt about group and what we thought the power of group was. Oh, sorry, now I need to move you guys back again so I can get my, there we go. Um, and I'll just read this out to you. Witnessing how a group of strangers becomes so connected as they navigate one of the biggest changes in their adult life is not only an honor, but also very rewarding. I love how we can hardly get a word in once the final groups roll around and how we continue to hear their connection for months and years um, uh, as uh, after their, their, their group care is completed. And that's Alison Rolf, who's one of my, I've been so lucky to be able to work with her through the years um, as my co-facilitator on Wednesday night groups. I'm going to flip here. I'm not going to go through all of this um, in that much detail. It's just a little bit about doula care itself. So that's the big for us at doula. So our doulas range in age from 20s to 60s. Um, many of them have part-time jobs or sometimes even full-time jobs that allow them to have some flexibility. Our doulas, like I said, there's 23, 24 of them, I think now, 23, 24. We have, it's been hard to, to recruit doulas through the pandemic, but we're starting to recruit more doulas and train more doulas. Approximately 65% of the doulas have children themselves. Um, the number of clients they take varies every month, and they just basically let the doula coordinator know uh, what their availability is every month. In 2021 um, and 2022, uh, SCBP doulas attended uh, 433 births with us. So it's a, it's a huge portion of the births that we do at South Habadula. 12 of our most active doulas did most of the births. Um, and, and then it was split with the rest of, uh, the, the, the doulas. And one thing that we've been really proud of is, is that they've, they've been front and center and in the hospitals through the duration of the pandemic, 88% of the time they were in the OR, um, for our clients as they went for an instrumental delivery, or, um, if they needed to have a cesarean section. Um, the way that they're matched, and maybe I won't kind of go in too much, but anyway, we have a doula coordinator who is basically a matchmaker and she connects people based on age and, um, you know, any of the criteria that are relevant for patients to their doula and the doula sees them. It is, it is a condensed version of the, the, the doula. It is not the same thing as if you were um, purchasing a doula out in the market. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And despite the fact that we have so much volume and so many different doulas, 92% of the time, they actually were the assigned doula was who was at your birth, which is amazing during the last few years when people have been sick and kids have been sick. Uh, and Jelena Grant is the magician behind how that all happens. She's been our doula coordinator since the beginning of time. Uh, and she's been a doula for 39 years in one shape or the other. All of the doulas, even if you've been working out in the community for years, they have to do some mentored births with us when they come on board. Um, we pay an honorarium and that's $500. And so if anybody knows what doulas costs, at least in Vancouver, it's anywhere between a thousand and two thousand dollars Now we get half of our funding from BC women's hospital and the other half of our funding we get from our South foundation, which we fundraise for and do a ton of work to try to raise enough money to cover our entire doula program. Um, and just a little bit of feedback. I mean, it's so lovely to work at South with such a huge team to hold, you know, so many families through our care and, um, and, 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 and grateful for our care. Um, yeah, move on with this here. And so in just in terms of successes, I'm sorry, I'm, I can't see my timer, but I feel like I'm probably getting shorter on time here. So um, I just sent you a quick message. We're approaching 20 minutes. So um, okay, so I'll just say very quickly, just in terms of our successes, um, we sort of, there was a study that came out in CMAJ and we, um, we basically, uh, it, through our program, we were able just to sort of see that we, we did save the hospital money. Um, and we largely think that that was related to having doulas very involved in our care. Um, and then just in terms of just for us over the last three years, we just, just looked at our data for PSBC. Um, and these are kind of just, if you want to take a quick look down, we did 1700 deliveries and our vaginal rate for every single year over the last three years has stayed at about 78%. Um, and 68% of our primates are going through connecting pregnancy. Challenges and they're going to come up in every other person. So I'll just drop them there. I think funding is on everybody's mind. How do we do this crazy thing when we have different funding models, when some people are at the table, longitudinal family practice is going to make it harder for us to get younger 
um, family docs to want to start doing this. Um, I think space to do it, leadership to, to run the larger teams, because it's not a nine to five leadership job in any way. Um, and charting, when you have bigger teams, the amount of charting, the amount of messaging, the amount of connection, the amount of commitment is huge. And so how do we pay for that? How do we do any of those things? Um, so maybe I'll tie it up there in the interest of time. Uh, I know this was a lot and probably each one of our little pillars could have actually been an individual talk, but that sort of sums up who we are at South. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Um, do we have any questions? from our group here. Kieran, uh, when you talk about the like EMR clinical discussions, is this just people bring stuff up when when they come across something, they'll just post it to the EMR and everybody can contribute? Yeah, so I would say it's a combination of things. Um, we call it our hive mind. I can't remember who started to name it that, but basically we feel like we have like, you know, 15, I mean, there's 14 of us care providers, there's five nurses, our nurse practitioner, we all have such a different, different backgrounds and different wealths of information. And so we put up a message and because there's so many of us, many of us are in, you know, several times in the day and we just start answering messages. And it's lovely because you often get, you know, many, many minds working on something that you might sort of feel a little bit skimped about, but often it's things like, does anybody have any resources for housing or does anybody have, what would you do in this particular clinical situation? So we use Oscar a lot, yeah, to message back and forth with each other about client care. Um, <clears throat> Liz. Hi. Um, when you said that you're paid sessional for clinic and call, right. I, I can't imagine that's like the sessional rate, like Linda, for MABC sessional rate for us. Is it like a set fee per it's shift? Yeah, and sorry, I didn't know what the best way to say it is, is that we have a set fee for what we pay for on call. We have a set fee for what we pay on second call. We have a set fee for what we do in clinic. And as soon as we get more money, we try to raise, but we haven't been able to raise our providers in a couple of years. And I think that every, every clinic is dealing with that. The cost of everything else has gone up. The cost of our MOAs, the cost of all of our supplies. And so I think... Um, yeah, we're we're definitely even though we're technically not a nonprofit, there's no profits in South Community Birth Program. And I think it's important also to just point out that there's no hierarchy in this collaborative practice. So it doesn't matter if you're a midwife, a physician, you're all paid the same in those sessional rates. So it's truly collaborative that way. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Yeah, everything is is pooled and paid out. And so, you know, as a GP, if I had a, a night um, where I did two births and they had long second stages, I would make way more money not working in a collaborative. But as a GP, if you run oxy all night long and sit there watching a terrible tracing, you also get paid nothing for it or very little for it. So we kind of have watched that if you, this is your main time gig, it all comes out. Some nights you'll be really busy and you won't get paid as much as if you were billing uh, as a GP, but other nights you'll sleep or, you, you know, you won't actually catch the birth. I think so much of it is because our model is attached to catching the baby, um, but that it makes it tricky. And so for us, we just pool all the billings and then, and then, and everybody gets paid the exact same thing. The money I will say is, is the thing you have to get over to, to do collaboration. You have to believe everybody deserves to be paid the same amount, even if the government doesn't pay us the same amount. It doesn't work otherwise. That would be my one huge thing when I've talked to folks around um, the province who want to do collaboration, you have to get behind the fact that you, you can't be paid differently. Otherwise, it, it's very hard to make it work cohesively. Sorry, I can't see the name. With no, um, the next person is Aline, but maybe just introduce yourself when you have a question. So we know who's talking. Hi, Kieran. Uh, hey. My name is Alina. I'm one of the midwives in Paul River. Hey. Um, I got a question about whether you're splitting uh, your caseload and tenatally. So besides your connecting pregnancy, obviously you still see people within clinic. Do you all 13 share the caseload or do you have like team orange, blue, red? Yada, yada, we're, yada. All, we're all, we all share it. So the way that we do it is everybody gets assigned a lead 
and we try to keep anti. So what we don't want to do is for you to see 14 people. That is the worst thing that could possibly happen. So when you come into care, if you're going to do group, which really is only for first time families, very few people repeat it also because the timing is in the evening, which anybody who has a small child knows that that's the the most disastrous time to ever do your care. Um, We do run night clinics twice a week though, for some of our families where they can't actually get out of work. Um, so we assign two leads. It's your group person. So if Linda's running group, she would those those would be Linda's leads. If I run group, those are my leads. But I also have leads that are my one on ones, and we try to set it up so that you're seeing no more than two people, with the knowledge it could stretch to three. Um, you know, and we also have to be a bit flexible for when our care providers go down. You know, they might have to see somebody else that day because uh, of that. But we do not want people seeing everybody on our team. What really is very shared is who's on call. So, you know, people know that we're, I mean, even though there's 14 of us, there's really, there's 10 of us who do most of the call and they know they could get anybody on call. And we do meet the team every, every two months so that they get the option to see us all uh, and get a, get a sense really. And that, that meet the team is really about them realizing we really like each other. We support each other, whoever you get is going to be there for you. And that I think the key is, is that, you know, if Linda and I are on call, we both come to, to birth from a different place. I was a rural GP. Um, you know, Linda has been birthing babies forever and ever and ever and ever that, our way that we're going to support you isn't going to be radically different. And I think that that's what people want in a collaborative is, is that they know that they're, that, that we all are different individuals, but we're not going to show up in the room and have a radically different approach to the person who was there 12 hours earlier. Oh, one more. I think we have time for one more question for Kieran. So Felix, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, my question is really, I look, you, I see you have 23 doulas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, that's impressive. Well, um, <laughs> looking at the number of doulas. So my, my question really is for a community like ours, which is more rural oriented, how can we attract doulas? Because that's part, one of the reasons why we couldn't offer a home birth here because we don't have the, you know, manpower from doula point of view or support um, that would support the midwives for, uh, yeah. for home birth. So um, how can we do that? I mean, it's a very good question. I, um, I would say one, <laughs> my answer to that question is, is, is not an answer. We're like, how do we keep our doulas from not all going to midwifery school? Because yeah. I think doula work is often something that, that, um, that people do because they love, they love birth. Um, you have to love birth, I think. So I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I mean, that's definitely a question I can talk to our doula coordinator about here. Um, I think it's really important to have local, probably some local or access to doula training in the community um, and, or have the ability of people to get some sort of training. And I don't know if there's a way to fund that definitely at South community birth program, anybody who comes from any of our IB POC communities and has an interest in doing, um, a doula care at South, we fund their training to do it. Um, so I think kind of looking at ways that if you are putting a collaboration together, there is some money that's set aside to training people might be something to consider. Linda, I don't know if you have anything else you would add to that. I think one of the things that we didn't say about our doulas at South is that they also uh, provide cultural brokerage, if you will. They're like cultural brokers because we have such a diverse community. And so, and I know that there are, um, I don't know how many First Nations women you serve in your area, but they have a doula program as well um, where they get special training and First Nations women can hire them through First Nations. So that might be a good place to start and then branch out from there. Um, Yeah. Otherwise, it's finding somebody who's really passionate about birth in the community and see if they're willing to start and then train others, have Mm -hmm. others join them. But yeah, to add to what Linda said, First Nations Health Authority does fund um, for $1,000 uh, doulas within uh, Indigenous and Metis communities, I believe. 
Um, so something to consider. Thank you very much, Karen and Linda. Um, if we have time at the end, maybe you'll get some more questions, but I think we need to move on now um, to the South Okanagan Birthing Center and welcome Megda as well. We'll put you third as you just get settled there. Um, so Jennifer, Susie and Tanya, we have you on the line. I don't know who wants to start. Um, Tanya's going to bring up our slides. I'm Susie Lobb and I'm one of the uh, founding midwives. I should clarify, it's not a birthing center. It is the South Okanagan Maternity Center. Um, we're based in our hospital, so kind of like a birthing center. Um, and thank you so much for having us. So a little bit of the background of us. We're looking forward to sharing how our model works. I'll, I won't spend unnecessary amounts of time on the same exact things that Kieran said, because we do have a lot of similarities. So I'll try to highlight what would be unique um, to us. And thank you, Kieran, for the South Community Birth Program. It is definitely the reason that the rest of us have had the abilities to get our clinics off the ground is such an inspiration. I remember reading about it in midwifery school in 2006 and thinking, oh, this is like the dream. This place is amazing. And it sure is. So we're based in Penticton at the Penticton Regional Hospital and our service area where people deliver their babies at Penticton Hospital extends um, about an hour and 20 minutes to the west towards Princeton, about an hour south towards the Soyuz, even a little bit towards the southeast towards Grand Forks. Um, some people have a little more choice over there, but they're all driving very far to have their babies. Um, and our population um, in that general area is about 90 3,000 people. Our hospital delivers about five to 600 a year. So it's on the small side. We had a large influx of births in 2021 following the pandemic exodus from the lower mainland, but that seems to have settled out a bit. Um, all right. Sorry, we could do the next slide, Tanya. Thank you. So as, as many ideas come, it first started with a crisis. This is back in 2012. Um, family physicians had previously worked in utter silos and then had moved toward uh, opening up a, a common practice within Penticton Hospital. Um, and sorry, just one sec. I gotta tell my kid to turn that TV. Sorry about that. He's yeah, Game of Thrones as a teenager. Um, so they were working together and there was a midwifery clinic, which still exists called Willow, which was working separately. Um, and one by one, a bunch of the doctors at the, the family doctor clinic were starting to retire from maternity care. And it was down to three providers and they were really, really hurting to just keep their doors open. So the divisions of family practice um, became involved um, and came to the community, including obstetricians, midwives, and family doctors to ask, how can we address this problem? So it wasn't really with the intention of um, coming up with a collaborative care practice, but through looking at other ways that people were doing things, such as the South Community Birth Program and Apple Tree and Nelson, um, eventually this idea came up. I will say it took a very long time to get there. Um, it, it, again, this wasn't the intention in 2012. The intention was, you know, save the family doctor clinic. What do we do? Um, and this is what came out of it through many, many meetings um, discussing the ways that we are motivated, the ways that what makes us passionate about birth, how we want to work, what's important to us. We realized that this, our group of family physicians and our midwives were far more similar than we were different. Um, and so that is what came of it.
think, yeah. So we have a, a fairly similar model, I think, to what Kieran was saying. So um, we bill midwifery care where possible. Um, so as long as they've seen uh, one of our midwives uh, through uh, each trimester, then we um, then after that they can see a combination of um, midwives or physicians. Uh, we've tried to make it so uh, that we offer to them that they can have a narrow or a large scope. We're not quite as big as as South, um, but we have. Um, multiple doctors and midwives um, in the clinic. And so sometimes people are like, you know what, we've really worked really hard to have continuity of care, even with without continuity of carer. Uh, so they could choose to see whatever works best for them. We're open five days a week, and maybe there's certain days that work and they're happy to see whoever is there. Um, and some people that are like, you know, I really would prefer a smaller um, cohort. And so we try to um, have them see a, one midwife and a physician through their um, pregnancy. Um, we have um, uh, made it that we uh, bill through the midwifery, through the um, antepartum and postpartum, but then uh, whoever does the delivery, family practice or midwife, uh, then that goes under that respective billing. Um, we've made it, we also have two people on call every day, one that runs the clinic and one that is doing the call. And we make one of those people a physician uh, every day because we sometimes provide care outside of the midwifery scope. So if somebody's come in, we, like everybody in the province, we have a, a very high unattached population and particularly high in our, our younger population that just hasn't had a a family doctor or nurse practitioner and so we're able to see them and manage things that wouldn't typically be within the midwifery scope uh, without having to send them to a walk-in walk clinic. Um, we also do uh, so we do the visits throughout the pregnancy and then we also do um, uh, two home visits from the uh, midwives um, at the first and second week. So they're not needing to come to the clinic typically until one month postpartum, uh, in most, most cases until they, unless they need some extra care. Um, and we've also set up some group medical visits, uh, off it set, set up a little bit to try to mimic South. Um, I also spent some time there, um, in medical school, um, learning that model. And then Michelle Linekin um, has, has brought that model to our group medical visits. We're not quite as far along, but we have a set of, uh, four visits um, that we um, have created during COVID when a lot of other things weren't available. Uh, in terms of revenue and resources, uh, so revenue, we have our MSP as well as a small amount of private billings for anything um, private pay. And then we have a partial health authority stipend uh, for our 24 hour call. I think this came out from, uh, a, well, I think it's been there for a long time, basically from the understanding that uh, you don't make as much money doing your maternity care as you would in your office. And so that was a partial stipend that just goes into the pot as well. Um, it's not full mocap funding, but it's just, um, it, it's just part of that. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, the health authority, uh, our clinic space is in the hospital. So they provided our clinic space and our main part of our equipment, uh, EMR, phone, internet. Uh, we have an IH MOA that we give some special training to so that she can uh, work in the different environment of the of the perinatal world. And there's also a perinatal social worker available uh, through the hospital that um, can come to see our patients as well. Uh, in terms of expenses, so we also pay um, our uh, two providers. So the one that's on call for the 24 hours and then one that's in clinic. Uh, a set fee. Uh, we did the same thing. We started small and then we slowly raised it. And then we just have gotten to the point now that we, uh, if we have a little bit of extra uh, money every three months, then we just pay it back to the providers based on the number of shifts they've worked. We pay our family physicians and midwives exactly the same. And so we just divide it up based on a number of shifts for that. Um, and then as the um, midwives do the home visits at the one week and two week home visits we pay directly to the midwife doing that um, visit the postpartum fee for midwifery easily pays for two home visits uh, for that plus the other ones that come into the clinic we pay ourselves for meeting uh, so we met a lot at the beginning I think it was every week actually um, and now that's now that's about once a month that we're meeting and we do a QI meeting as well as an administrative meeting and we do that at the same time 
Uh, we have admin support through the Division of Family Practice and uh, we pay for that from our billings. So for both to do our billing as well as just Tanya to coordinate our group. Um, and we also pay ourselves if we do some of those leadership roles. So if you're doing scheduling or if you're doing students and review and everything like that. So, um, and then we've made some additional purchases. Uh, so we bought group uh, group vests um, to identify ourselves. We've bought some um, equipment and books for our um, prenatal classes. We purchased a bedside ultrasound actually just for um, um, just doing quick head checks and um, viability scans. So very minimal what we do with it, but there it's available. Um, and then just things like, you know, retirement or uh, things that if there's been things happening within our group, we kind of buy each other things for that too. Um, and then on the next slide, we just have a quick little, a couple pictures of kind of what our office looks like there. Um, so in the first one on the left, uh, that's just one of our clinic rooms. We weren't really supposed to put any decorations up on the walls. So actually the decorations are on, on the door side. So you don't see them as you're going up because it's in the hospital and they're minimalists like that. Um, and then the, the one on the far right, we actually have two rooms like the one on the left. And then the one on the far right is just kind of our, it was meant to be our initial kind of just meet and greet room. So it's a little bit more comfortable with a couch. Um, but often we're doing our initial visits because there's not really a whole lot to do. We've been doing those virtually uh, on video um, through our EMR. Um, and then the um, and then the one in the middle is just, we've got two computers and then we've got our MOA that sits there too. So. so someone in the chat asked our yearly caseload and I actually don't know. I'm not sure if Tanya knows that. The numbers vary widely per month from like, you can we can have as few as like, 15 to 25 or 26. So if you can quickly do the math, um, that's our caseload. Um, we have three midwives and five GPs. So that makes it quite easy to always have a GP who's on the schedule for things like Synthroid and um, out, you know, out of midwifery scope access. So what's working well? Um, I really like the way Kieran talked about their, their open culture. And I would say that is, I echo the importance of that. Um, when we first got together, so those of you who are thinking of doing something, we spent many, many hours having dinner together. And again, getting to the bones of like why we love doing what we do and what is our dedication and what is our, what are our values in caring for people? And I think that was an absolute core to the foundation. Um, as many of you know, like informed choice is a, a tenant of midwifery care. And we're, we're raised from day one of midwifery school um, to see the ultimate value in that. So we, we get into the into the discussions, how do we talk about group B strap? How do we, you know, how how do we address clinical situations? What do we do when somebody wants to do something outside of the recommendation? Um, and then we do work very hard to continue to be on the same page so that our patients are getting the same information from us and not finding difference. When they meet a different provider, they're not getting different care. Um, it's a commitment on all of our parts to be very open to feedback and to receiving and asking for feedback and to giving it in a kind way. Um, there, is, there have been times where yeah, you're just, the openness is, is essential because, you know, this work can be very hard when it's hard, it's really hard. And so there's an, an open door to asking for questions and help. We have a new GP on board with us. And I think she feels very comfortable picking up the phone anytime, day or night and calling whoever the provider is, you know, her partner provider, whether it's a midwife or doctor to ask for advice on clinical care. And I think that is a, a real benefit to working here. It's a, a very supportive culture. Um, so like Jen said, we meet monthly for quality reviews. We also do things you know, as they come up, if something urgent comes up or if it's a little question that we can do by email, we'll, we'll case review in that, in that way. 
Um, the way our structure is set, we have a core group of providers and then we have locums. So the core group are the original members. When we, when we began the clinic, everybody had a role specific to them. So there's a scheduler, a finance lead, a quality lead, et cetera. Um, and then people who join in since that time have a locum role. Um, but it, we try to be really fair with giving, um, giving shifts. So I think that everybody's happy with the amount of work that we're getting, but we did find that when we expanded quite quickly with the increased birth numbers in 2021, we, we still have to have sort of a, a priority group um, for decision-making, et cetera. Um, I'm just looking at my notes real quick. So yeah, home home birth we don't have. Um, there is a midwifery clinic in town that offers that. Um, and when we first joined, I was the only midwife um, with you know working with five doctors who never provided home birth. So it it was a rather uphill type of thing to try and face when there already was a clinic offering that. So that continues to be um, the situation. And we are you know. Always, we always, we have a policy of asking people what their preferences are in the beginning of when they arrive. So if somebody is interested in home birth, they're they're gonna find it. We're gonna help them find it. We're not we're not a barrier to somebody getting a home birth. We do home visits in the postpartum, um, two home visits provided by the midwives, and then back in the clinic for weeks four and week six, um, and then the regular. Um, prenatal visit schedule. Our visits are 20 minutes long. The first one is quite a bit longer to be able to get all that work done. Um, and we do have plenty of students. So we we usually have a rotation of medical students, fourth year medical students and family practice residents. We recently have gotten our first uh, midwifery student, which is going really well. Um, and she's really enjoying the collaborative model and the things that she's learning from doctors as well as midwives. Um, there was one more thing I was supposed to say on this slide. Well, I think I had part on there too, just yeah, yeah, with the, from the group prenatal um, education. Um, so I think there was a question about how we incorporated our PCN or how has that helped to support our network. And um, because we've created these um, prenatal classes led by one of our physicians and supported by divisions, um, we were able to reach out to, we've got a dietitian um, and a physiotherapist, um, physiotherapist that happens to be a pelvic floor <laughs> a specialist um, that works within our, our PCN. And so uh, a couple of the sessions uh, were co-facilitated by a PCN dietitian and a PCN uh, physiotherapist with a focus on that pelvic floor physio. So that was a neat way that we were able to get that support. Okay, we got a minute and a half. So um, we've learned a lot along the way. Um, I, I can't speak highly enough for the model in terms of a, being a care provider. Our patients based on survey results are, are quite happy. Um, we're getting a lot of good feedback. I really think it's important for each community to find a model that works for them because what we learned as we researched the existing collaborative care models in all their forms back in 2016-ish was that each community you know, had something major that the way they did things wouldn't work for us because of this or that. So we just had to hammer it out and, and figure out what, what we could do and how to make it work. So I think everyone's happier if you you really get to what your community needs are. Yeah, and I think it. Um, we kind of found at the beginning, uh, so at our hospital, um, midwives didn't have C-section uh, privileges. And so that was, again, it was like another thing. They're like, oh, well, there needs to be training. I was like, well, I was just kind of, thrown in there in med school, but you know, nonetheless, we'll go through the hoops. And so we had a couple of our obstetricians that were quite supportive of it. And so to make sure to kind of get those hours and now it's just an integrated schedule. So um, back before 
kind of our numbers increased, we usually actually only had one person on call, um, but we would always have a physician back up. Um, and, and then that person would come in and do the C-sections if Susie was on call. And so once Susie did her training and then when two other uh, midwives joined us, they did their training as well. And it just, it just makes it more seamless to be able to do that. So, and then again, I think there is yeah, through that communication and guidelines and protocols that we can really ensure that there's a continuity of care between different carers. Cause I think that's sometimes probably seems overwhelming to people coming to the clinic. And even I think from, for the providers um, who are used to doing, you know, all their own patients kind of really making sure that you can feel comfortable working in that model. Yeah. There's a lot of talk always about the burnout rate of midwives. Obviously, we know GPs are struggling massively right now. Um, but I also, you know, I also hear tension talk about the the change away from the traditional model of midwifery in, in you know, with the interest in collaborative practices and what will that do? And I have to say, I absolutely love my job. I feel like I was born to be a midwife. I would not be a midwife anymore if I hadn't been able to do this. I could, I could, I, I was eight years in, I was absolutely burnt out. I had my third kid. I was, I was not coping at all with the demands of a constant call schedule and my life. So, you know, we have to, we have to open our minds. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sure we have questions. So let's open the floor for a few of those. Hi, this is Liz, one of the midwives in Powell River. I put two questions in the chat um, just because I have a crying baby here. So maybe you can look at those and respond. Thanks. I saw the caseload one. Did you hear my response to that or was baby crying at that time? Yeah, it wasn't that one, but maybe I didn't do it right. A anyways, um, which EMR do you use? We use Med Access. Okay. And then, <laughs> sorry, I forgot my own question. <laughs> I don't see them there. Liz. I'm just looking. Oh, okay. Um, oh, it looks like I sent them to Felix on accident. Sorry. Who is the baby doc when you go to C-section? Do you have a pediatrician? We do. That's our hospital policy. Yeah. Okay. We did have a period of time where we were quite short on our pediatricians and, and it, there were some of us that were stepping in and, and being baby docs. Um, as well as funny, I moved from rural Saskatchewan. So like our whole team was family doctors. So there was the, the C-section, the assist, the pediatrician and the anesthesia were all family doctors. And so, but when you, go, when you come and you get used to having a pediatrician always behind you, it was like a little bit stressful, but you know, once you get into it, it was, it was fine. And, and we, we did that when it needed to happen. So. Thanks. Um, I see Aline's hand up. Hey, Susie, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think it really resonates with us that you're saying, um, you know, the, uh, the, the works towards collaboration and to set it up take, took a lot of time. What, um, can you describe the role of the family uh, practice of division in, in this collaboration? The divisions of family practice was absolutely essential. They hosted our meetings. They they directed our meetings again, not with, they didn't know what the end goal was, but they know how to run meetings and they know how to foster collaborative discussions. Um, they served us dinner. Yeah, they, they, they were a key part. And then I think that we were able to continue to, if correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but I think we had a, um, a program manager who was funded by the divisions with us for like a, a period of time after we started because it was heavy heavy lifting and then we switched over to uh, us paying for that role but they were they helped us really get off the ground yeah the first year uh the first year i think the shared care project actually uh continued to pay for us to meet as we were making all this difference and and then paid for administrative side of things and then Yes, and now that just comes out of our fee-for-service. Liz? Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to how it came to be that the health authority gave paid for your space and your MOA. 
was that negotiation? Oh yeah, that's old. <laughs> um, it it's was a grandfather it was actually, situation. Yeah, so it, it was the maternity clinic has been in there. So I came here in two thousand five or six, I think for one of my med school rotations. And it was in the clinic at that point in time, it was all family doctor run. Um, and so that just kind of, we just have silently <laughs> taken that to continue. So it, I mean, it is, I think it's helpful. And I think you can, you can, you can discuss about, you know, patient access and patient care. And I think there was a, uh, there was a crisis in, in maternity providers that was happening as everybody was giving up their privileges and, and recognizing that it just wasn't a sustainable model. And so I think they just stepped up and said, we'll host you here if you guys keep working in this model. And then it just has continued. Thank you. Yeah, I think we see some parallels with your community. So I wouldn't be surprised if there is more questions. Oh, do we have time for one more? But I want to make sure we give Megda enough time to do her complete um, presentation as well. So if you want to go quickly, go for it. Yes. Um, you were saying that uh, at your site and in your area, you've noticed a drop in physicians as well that we're providing maternity services. Was it able for you guys to recruit them uh, back as soon as you had collaborative care or did you have to recruit new ones? Like how, you know, how was your connection? That, I think nobody wants to be on a sinking ship, right? Like, so once we started and people saw how great it was going, then the doctors were like banging down our doors, like new residents, like we have more providers than we can actually have work for now. Yeah, we felt bad. We actually had to turn away a couple people that so they actually didn't even come to the community because they wanted to be able to work in the model and, and we just couldn't guarantee that they would have a, a number of shifts that they would want to do or need to do to keep up um, their skills and so it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> I think it just, I think when it, it helped to stabilize too with having Susie and then with two additional midwives, because that's that's, that's what they do. Right. Um, whereas, you know, we work in lots of different places. And so when they take on, you know, a, a significant number of the shifts that really help to stabilize it. And then, yeah, people just see that it's a great model to work in. It's well supported. You can, you know, really do as few shifts as you want. And we have like lots of like, everybody always steps up to, to help out if you need to get out of a shift as well. So it's a great group. Oh. We then also say that financially there has been an improvement for physicians to keep working. Yeah, I think there was. I mean, honestly, we we used to all just do fee for service for the shifts and you would you would come in and you might get paid paid almost nothing for your 24 hour shift, or you might kind of, you might have three deliveries and then do that. So I think once we started pooling the billing, that was also more sustainable. And then the midwifery model of um, payment for the, both the prenatal and the postpartum is, is, is much better than what the family doctor fee for service model is. It just is like, if you look at a total course, course of care for a prenatal for, for second and third trimester, it's about a thousand dollars for that time. It's about a thousand dollars for the delivery and it's about a thousand dollars for postpartum. And if you look at the family physician, even billing for like the prenatal, the delivery, and then the postpartum billing mom and baby for, you know, one week, two week, four weeks, and six weeks, um, it is like, $240 for the postpartum care. And I think somewhere between six and $700 um, for the um, antipartum care. So it just, it makes a difference when you have that stability. And then it also helps with, with no shows that it doesn't hurt as much if they don't come to their appointment. Um, we still, of course, try to get them in, but you're not held like individually if, if they don't. And, and MSP didn't give you uh, challenges to co-side bill with each other but yeah. no, as long as we, we bill for anything that's like outside of scope of care. So for prescribing for contraception or prescribing anxiety medication or thyroid medication or anything like that, we bill that, um, you know, as an extra code, but as long as, as long as one of our amazing midwives has seen the um, patient in the trimester, then we can bill for that for the trimester. And it doesn't matter who else they see during that trimester. Thank you. Our birth numbers are in the chat for anyone who's curious.
<laughs> awesome. Thank you, Tom. Um, I am going to leave it there. Thank you so much for that thorough presentation. Um, and I'm going to hand the mic over to Chickadee Maternity Collaborative. Thanks, Gardy. I'm going to try and share my screen. Hopefully, you guys can see it. Um, can you see that? Okay. Um, so Chickadee Maternity Collaborative um, is just for our land acknowledgement on the territory of the Treaty 8 First Nations, and that is located in the South Peace. Um, most of you probably have never been that far north in BC, but we are um, just on the border um, with Alberta, close to Grand Prairie, basically, so far north. Um, our mission is to believe that the pregnancy is state of health and that childbirth is a normal physiological process and a profound event. We strive to care, um, to be care providers who respect and support birthing people so um, they may give birth in a safe and safely power and with safety, power and, indig and with dignity. Our purpose is to provide safe, respectful maternity care and to facilitate connections of allied services and um, resources. So about us, um, like I mentioned, we're a, a maternity care um, practice based in Dawson Creek, BC, and serve quite a uh, big uh, area. Um, our catchment area includes Tumblr Ridge, Chetwind, um, and we do see patients as far as Hudson's Hope, as our neighboring community does not do any diabetic care in pregnancy, so that falls on us. And we are a team of doctors and midwife um, and then interprofessional team members, including nurses, diabetic education, a mental health pharmacist, social worker, and primary care assistants. Um, we embrace a holistic approach and I appreciate the complex social, emotional, and cultural, spiritual, physiological, and physical ramifications of each reproductive cycle. Um, referral and self-referred patients are seen and we see patients from conce conception to six weeks post, not party, but it's probably a party postpartum. <laughs> Sorry for the self out there. Um, so our team currently, we consist of five physicians, one um, obstet obstetric specialist, five part-time primary care nurses, diabetic education nurse, which we do collaboration with diabetic education team in Prince George. We have a primary care pharmacist, two primary care assistants, a nurse practitioner, and a midwife. Um, we've just applied for a team-based care grant and hoping to add to this team a social work assistant, a mental health counselor, and an Aboriginal liaison. Why did we do a collaborative model? There was lots of strains on maternity care in the South, is pretty much what you heard from everybody else, and I'm pretty sure you are experiencing the same. Um, we looked at a collaborative model to deliver quality of care and to have a sustainable environment with reduced burnout and support for recruitment and retention of providers. So we're pretty new to the scene in October 2020. Um, we established a working group. Um, this working group consisted uh, of Northern Health Authority, the physicians, the midwife. Um, we are not a division or part of a division, but a self-organizing group. So our self-organizing group was involved as well. We managed to secure funding from Rome. Um, the GPC, GPC Maternity Care Initiative Grant um, came out just around that time. We also applied for a minor tenant, tenant improvement grant and a one-time startup grant from the ministry. And then we managed to secure early funding on an early PCA and draw, although we do not have an existing PCA in yet. Um, we did community engagement from February to July in 2021. Um, and just as a note, um, I feel that's one of our biggest successes was involving the community in every step of our process. Um, we did community team mapping in February. Um, we had chats with various other models um, before we started. And then we did EMR training in July um, due to then the pandemic and everything being shortened, our renovations and equipment um, was a little bit July, del delayed and we couldn't start work in the clinic till November. And the clinic has been involved in various, various quality improvement activities. Um, we do team building, team mapping, small group learning sessions, and monthly team meetings. Um, and we have an action list that's ongoing that we work on on a Jamboard. Um, 
some specifics that you guys asked about is administrative support. Um, so as mentioned, we were only drawn PCN. Um, so our RN and our PCA in the clinic is um, contracts are held by Northern Health and then managed by their interprofessional team lead. All clinical guidelines are managed by the midwife as we practice according to the midwifery model of care and all clinic administration other than staffing is managed by myself as the director of the clinic. Um, our integration with the PCA and our ERI was just accepted on Monday. Um, so we're hoping to build our PCA in, in the next few months here, um, but have a few projects in town that's already early draws on PCA and so just needs to be slotted into position. Um, we negotiated um, this with the government um, and our location was specifically chosen to be part of a patient medical home. We are co-located with um, family services um, as well as counselors and mental health specialists. So once our PCN is up and rolling, we don't even need to move space because we're right there. Um, links of other programs. We do have interprofessional team um, that comes into the clinic to see all the patients. So we practice from care in one place um, and that one place being the right place in the clinic. We do use a virtual platform as well. So our outlying communities are seen by our, our EMRs virtual platform. And I know you're going to ask, so that's med access, the same as, the, as in Okanagan. We used to be in Akira, which was the biggest mistake we ever made. Um, so my second piece of advice to you is make sure whichever EMR you choose works well for your community and also works well with the maternity form as we all use it, the provincial form. Um, and med access in our community is used by all the other clinics. So having the same EMR as the family physicians makes communication much easier. Our successes, um, as we have 100% of attachment in the community, all pregnant patients come to our clinic. Um, the patients love the model. Um, we do a lot of QI work and do get extra funding through the QI work we do. We currently are um, in the process of putting up a maternity wall, um, which reflects all the babies being born in the clinic and patients can purchase um, either a chickadee or a uh, leave to go on the tree and all the money that we um, get from this initiative goes towards our hospital again so we purchase equipment for our um, neonatal unit at the hospital um, we do have some merchandise as well um, patients just love that the concept of what we brought about and so we have little onesies for or our newborn babies that says chickadees chicks um, and the parents just love that again all, all money made from that goes towards the hospital um, and we have an open door so patients can book have booked appointments but can also walk in and be seen on the same day we try and phone urgent results back to patients if they called about it on the same day just fun things to do um, we also have our ultrasound in the clinic just for bedside pokers but nothing special um, patients love the little personal touches of that how our payment structure work so when we negotiated to get an early draw on the PCN funding, the question came up whether we were interested in APP, um, uh, alternative payment plan for those that don't know. Um, we looked at our numbers specifically and it made more sense to go on to an APP. Um, so subsequently we see do all our clinic work, the non-clinical work and administration work in the clinic on the APP. Um, that is enough to compensate for the fact that we have longer appointment time. So we see on average between 18 and 22 patients a day. Um, like Jennifer mentioned, if there's no shows, we don't have to worry because it's all covered by our APP. And currently our doctor in clinic is also the doctor on call just because of our um, low numbers. So um, if the doctor has to run for a delivery, the clinic can continue to function because all our RNs are actually our labor and delivery nurses as well that works in the clinic. So, um, Fee for service is what we bill for anything that happens outside of the clinic. And then our staff is currently paid by Northern Health on that early draw of PCN funding. Our challenges is staffing uh, because it's Northern Health employees. We frequently run into a problem where somebody calls sick and there's nobody else to replace the staff. I'm pretty sure we all know about the troubles. And then um, because we're so far north, locum support has been a problem. 
Um, and then currently we're not offering home births. Our midwife just herself had a baby, so it's not possible for her to, to offer the service, but we're hoping to recruit more midwives and be able to offer home births. Um, communication for us happens um, through three platforms. Um, we have a signal group um, that we talk about patient care. Um, the EMR we use for messaging specifically because we can communicate with all the clinics in town. And then we have monthly team meetings. We do do group care um, for prenatal classes and for our diabetic management um, and hoping to roll out more group care in the second phase, which is our year two of our project. Um, virtual care is through Med Access through their platform called Pomelo. Um, and then we, we do have a team-based approach for our virtual care as well. So our patients would see their family doctor or nurse practitioner in our outlying communities and have a same day appointment with us either over the phone or in clinic virtual visit um, through telehealth if possible. And this is our space. So just a couple of photos, one of our team there and we just re like recently celebrated our first year, had beautiful cupcakes for that. Um, and that's just some pictures of the clinic inside. We call it a spa. It used to be a spa and still looks like a spa inside. Um, sticking with our um, gender neutral colors. Um, just you see our examination rooms, our outside wall and our entrance there. So do you have any questions for me? Hi, this is Liz, one of the midwives in Paul River. I and this might have been on one of your early slides. Is the clinic space covered through the PCN or is so, you pay for it out of your group? Yeah, so the only thing that's covered by the PCN is the salaries of our staff. The rest of our overhead is paid by ourselves, but our overhead is quite minimal. Um, the only thing that we cover in our overhead is our rent, um, our EMR, our telephone and fax expenses, um, insurance. Unfortunately, we all have to have that and then um, triple net for the, the rest of the stuff that needs to happen around the clinic, like snow removal, uh, which you guys don't see a lot of either. But yes, um, so our overhead range is between 4,000 and 6,000 a month at maximum. Which is shared between everybody in the clinic. Go ahead. Brigida. Yeah, Dom uh, from Power, Power River, the Cadet Hospital. Um, who, is doing, who is doing your uh, baby call? Do you have two people on call, like one maternity provider, one neonatal provider, or is this. Um, no, we do not. Is this. Okay. Uh, do you do this? We have limited physicians, that's not possible. So we do our own baby care. If you deliver the baby, you also take care, uh, take care of the baby. Um, we do not have pediatricians and um, all of our, our maternity providers is NRP certified. So is all of our ER providers. So when the doc needs help, we do call a code pink in our hospital and, and everybody would come running, including the eMERGE doc, which will help out then with the baby if the primary provider is busy with the mom still after delivery. Um, we also, we just have one gynecologist, so he shares call for advanced obstetrics with two of the GPs um, for GP obstetrics. So the only time that when he delivers, we come in to support his babies. Any other questions? Amy's Hi, reaching Meg. for mute. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Hi, Meg. It's Amy. Nice to see you. Hi, Hi, what is what is your birth rate approximately up there? I forget in that um, area. So so currently our numbers, like everybody else, had uh, quite a bit of a dip there in 2019, 2020 and picking back up. So currently we're doing 360 deliveries a year between five physicians. Wow. You guys are busy. We are. <laughs> we just, we, for the last two months, we've had double hat tricks is what we call them. We've had three babies every day on every weekend. So. And this is Liz again. Is your midwife doing deliveries? Before she's on, 
Yeah, she's currently on maternity leave, um, so not doing any work for us at the moment. But when she before maternity leave, she was doing call with us, so we rotate call, um, and she we all build fee for service and get got paid accordingly. We do get ten percent of our fee for service back um, that we try to build up contingency with to be able to pay for locums at the end of in, each fiscal year because we're a nonprofit and whatever's left in the account gets paid back proportionally to the physicians so they do get whatever they put in if we didn't use it for locum coverage but it is available for that and then the midwife bills all first um, trimesters so we make sure that all first visits happens with the midwife when she was there so that she can be able to build that first trimester um, uh, fees and then her her um, delivery fees and she it's quite profitable for her I have to tell you that. Hi, this is Aline. Um, can you, sorry, can you tell me a bit more about the alternative payment plan for physicians? So the alternative payment plan depends on um, what your your town's um, ranking is. I don't know. Do you know what you are, Amy? Which category you fall into? We're not a, we don't get a category. We're the strange in between size, unfortunately, Magda. We can't get an APP. So, oh, yeah. So, the APP depends on how big your rural community is. And then, um, and, and just like we would get an additional rural retention funding um, on top of fee for service that gets determined by the PMA, actually. So, our funding came from the 2019 PMA. Um, and it's changing now with the new PMA that was just ratified. Um, so all APP is being increased. Um, but for us, it works perfectly. So I'm sad if you can't get an APP because it, it's it's very um, it's it's comparative to what the docs are getting on the new um, longitudinal payment model. Brigitte, did you have one more question? Oh, you're on mute. I see every question. Do all your doctors uh, have a clinic with with other people, or do you only do maternity? Because so this is the all, problem. We all have our own clinics, and then we have the maternity clinic, um, which is just a block away from our hospital currently, and we rotate through the clinic. So we work. Um, each do one day a week shift in the clinic. And that day that you're in the clinic, you're also on call. Um, so it, it means that there's four days that you do not get disturbed. So the person who works on a Monday actually will do the call on the weekend. Um, and then we alternate the days according to um, our schedule. So it's a basic schedule of A, B, C, D, E, and we just work it through. So you can work out for the whole year when you're working and not working and, and change out your shifts. The only thing we determine before the time is uh, our long weekends and um, statutory holidays to ensure that everybody gets an equal amount of these. Um, and otherwise, the, the schedule is pretty easy to determine. The docs know when they're in clinic. Um, like I say, currently, um, the, it was to their benefit to work in the clinic um, because of the payment structure being more than they can actually earn for a day in their own clinics. And because the overhead is very minimal, it works out to less than less than $250 a day um, in overhead for the, the days that they spend there. It has not been a problem for our community. It, it, it all depends on how, how your community functions together. Our patients like the fact that they know there's only one space that they need to go to, that they can self-refer there, that they can walk in and have a practice done, have a pregnancy confirmation and get their early ultrasounds booked already. Um, they come there for miscarriages, for any question that they have. They know how to reach the physicians um, and that's, that's created um, a big sense of, of um, belonging for our community um, because we lost so many providers that how this all started is we lost six delivery providers in a, in a short space of six months so went from 11, 11 maternity providers to only 
um, five and then um, the midwife we had two midwives and one left as well so there was a big need for us to make a change to be able to accommodate every patient in our community being that we do do a large amount of deliveries for our small area and it, it every part of our step has been a collaboration between the docs between the midwife between northern health um and between our patients. So every step was decided, even the clinic name was decided by the community. Um, we tried to make sure that the patients are involved in every step and that what we're doing in our clinic is actually a reflection of what the community wanted. So we paid a lot of money for our engagement survey um, and based everything around our engagement with the, with the population. And Ironically, we, we did not tell them what we wanted to have from this. We had a plan of what we wanted to see um, and what we wanted this clinic to look like. And the engagement literally highlighted all of the things that we put on paper um, that the community actually asked for. So engagement, very important. Thank you, Magda. Um, we're at one minute to seven, so in the interest of getting everyone out of here on time, I think I'll wrap it up unless there's one very quick burning question that anyone has while we have everyone on the phone. Oh, Felix. Hi, uh, uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, just to say, I've actually, did, I've done locum in Dawson Creek um, back in, I think, 2014. Um, um, yeah, so I have a bit of an idea how, you know, the landscape and everything look, uh, but I want to find out in terms of the OB, the OB is not part of this clinic, right? No, he is. No, Sorry? he is. He sees all prenatal high-risk patients in our clinic. So he has his own clinic day on Wednesdays that all patients that is referred to him or consulted to him get seen on. Um, most of our patients who, like we do our own gestational diabetes on um, diet control will be managed by us. Anybody that goes on insulin will be managed by him. And he just consults and sends back to us. The same with high BMI patients, he would consult and send back to us. So it's a complete shared, shared care clinic. But again, it's the only OBGYN in our town. So there isn't any other options. And because we decided to have a one-stop shop for our patients where they can come for care, no matter whom the care is with, he joined the clinic. Okay, so all obstetric patients go to that clinic. And then yeah, if, yeah. If, if, if the patient is referred to him, um, is there a specific day that he comes to clinic to see all the patients referred to him or how does that work? Correct. Yeah, so he comes to clinic on Wednesdays and he sees all the patients that is referred to him on a Wednesday. So other than Wednesday, he doesn't see any other obstetric patient apart yeah. from Wednesdays. Right. That was interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so the big move is to um to move the specialist away from low risk obstetrics and have them just do high risk obstetrics, which is what we aim to do in this clinic. So we do all of the low risk work. He does the mm -hmm. high risk work. And we, because we're also his baby doc at the end of the day, it's important mm -hmm. that we have a team approach. He doesn't do any of the postpartum care that happens to be done by us in the clinic. And then um, our midwife does usually the first 10 days she would do a home visits. So when she's back, that will happen. She's coming back early from maternity leave to start doing that for us in March. Um, so patients first 10 days does not come into the clinic. They get seen at home and then we follow up with everything else. And in terms of payment, um, is he a fee for service or alternate payment? He's on fee for service. Okay. Um, it's only the primary care docs that's on APP. Okay. Okay, so then that makes a bit of a... Uh, yeah, okay. just because consult consultation fees for him is higher, so he will struggle to make that an APP. Okay, then interest from, from fee of service point of view and the fact that he only consults for high risk um, and he's not a primary physician for most of, for, for virtually all the patients, that means in terms of delivery, he doesn't actually have a patient of his own. No, and he does. He delivers the high-risk patients that he follows. Oh, just um, the high-risk patients alone, okay. 
uh, all primary deliveries gets done by the rest of the group. And then we're two GP obstetricians. So um, we alternate call. He has 14 days of call a month. And then the two GP ops has seven days each of call. And if one of his patients comes in on a day that he's not on call, we would manage that patient as the GP obstetrics. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Right. Thank you very much, everyone that presented today. I think we have lots to think about. Um, so I'll follow up with everybody to make sure they get their sessionals for participating today. And um, if you have any questions for the presenters, I'm sure I can funnel them through if they didn't get answered today. And watch for my email regarding session number two coming up in March. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.